Welcome everyone. I'm John MacArthur, Director of the Center for Sustainable Development at Brookings. On behalf of my co-editors, Amar Bhattacharya and Homi Cross and the rest of our center, we're very pleased to welcome you to this launch event for our new edited volume, Keys to Climate Action, How Developing Countries Could Drive Global Success and Local Prosperity. As a bit of backdrop, Roughly 18 months ago, we had a conversation with colleagues at the Rockefeller Foundation about the need to elevate the perspectives of developing countries as a centerpiece to the global fight against climate change. Too many of the international discussions have been dominated by people from advanced economies, including people like me from North America. Although much of the world's climate fate lies in the hands of emerging markets and developing economies, even holding aside the special case of China. As Amar, Homi, and I write in the introduction to this volume, the physical forces of climate change are having profound influence on the economic forces of growth and development and vice versa. Today, billions of people in developing countries are fighting problems of deep poverty while also confronting the most severe consequences of climate change, which are often compounding their economic challenges. These countries' challenges will define many contours of the world's challenges. Tackling these interconnected issues requires a new conceptual paradigm for sustainable development and a new global policy narrative that elevates the essential, evolving, and diverse perspectives of developing countries themselves. So that's what we aim to help do in this project. With the generous support of the Rockefeller Foundation and our spectacular project manager, Daniel Bicknell, we brought together a distinguished group of contributors to describe the climate and development outlook from their own country or geography-based perspective. The authors in their respective chapter titles are shown in a couple of slides here. You see we have Salimul Haq and Mizan Khan talking about Bangladesh. In a chapter on Egypt, Hala Abu Ali, Amira Al Ayuti, and Mahmoud Mahuldin. On India, Montek Singh Alawalia and Utkarsh Patel. On Indonesia, Muhammad Shatib Basri and Tiyuku Rifki. On Nigeria, Belinda Archibong and Philip Osafo Kwako. On South Africa, Richard Kaland. On the challenges of the region of East Africa, Unjaguna Undungu and Theophil Azumahu. On Africa's continental challenge, Vera Songwe and JP Adam. On Latin America and the Caribbean, Daniel Teitelman, Michael Hani, Noel Perez Benitez, and Jean-Baptiste Carpentier. On the challenges of the vulnerable 20, the so-called V20 countries, Sarah Jane Ahmed. And again, on the global challenges of financing for developing economies, Montek Singh Alawalia and Utkarsh Patel. A small army of research teams help support these authors, and I'd like to thank our own research analysts, Odera Onyechi and Charlotte Rivard, for their fantastic efforts, in addition to a range of interns at our center who contributed so much. Today, we're launching all of these chapters, initially as working papers on the Brookings website. This begins something of a rolling launch process over the coming months. The working papers will soon be converted into formal chapters, printed in a formal book, and reposted as such on our website. But we didn't want the physical production process to impede all the author's important insights and ideas in contributing to the urgent global debates. Leading, for example, to this year's G20 summit in India, the COP28 climate summit in United Arab Emirates, the multilateral development bank reform agenda, and dare I add, even the search for a new World Bank president. Today, you'll hear a panel that brings together just some of the extraordinary contributors to this edited volume. We're honored that many contributing authors are also joining today's event live in the audience online. Altogether, the contributions in this volume highlight the urgent, complex, and large-scale issues at stake. For example, there's a crucial need to upgrade global investments in climate adaptation and resilience. Many countries need support to overcome their energy access conundrum. Between the pressure to expand energy access to people with no access and the pressure to transition to new long-term sources of energy, this quickly takes us to the financing gap within and across borders, the latter amounting to roughly a trillion dollars a year. 
To help us dive in, we invited our friend and colleague Zia Khan, Senior Vice President for Innovation at the Rockefeller Foundation, to help kick us off with some framing thoughts. As mentioned, today would not be possible without the Rockefeller Foundation's generous support. And I'd like to underscore our gratitude to Kevin O'Neill and Nicole Razul at the Foundation for their amazing partnership and support throughout this project too. Our work at Brookings is only possible thanks to the contributions of our philanthropic partners. Zia, we're so happy you could join us today to lend your expertise. And for our audience, let me please emphasize Brookings' commitment to independence and underscore that all views expressed in today's event are solely those of the speakers. That said, the Rockefeller Foundation has recently made large strategic investments in tackling climate change and promoting access to energy. And Zia himself has played a unique role in helping to shape the foundation's strategic thinking now over many years. He's also, I'm happy to say, a close collaborator and partner as my co-chair in the 17 Rooms Initiative for the Sustainable Development Goals. Zia, we're honored that you're able to join us here today. Over to you. Thank you so much, John. It's wonderful to be here at this really important milestone. And first, a big thanks to you, to Amar, Homi, Daniel, and the other partners at the Center for Sustainable Development. When my colleagues, uh, Kevin and Nicole, on our New Frontiers team at the Rockefeller Foundation were first pondering this question of, there's a gap between the Green New Deal narrative that works for developed economies and what will work for developing economies, we could think of no better partners than you and your colleagues at the Center of Sustainable Development with your unique network leadership approach to elevating diverse insights and perspectives. The Rockefeller Foundation's mission for the past 110 years has been to promote the well-being of humankind throughout the world. Today, climate change is the dominant and universal threat to everyone's well-being. In response, the foundation is pivoting the entire organization to facing this challenge, and we're building on some existing initiatives like the Global Energy Alliance that seeks to reduce carbon emissions, expand energy access, and enable sustainable livelihoods, and also our work on food as medicine that promotes better and more climate-friendly agricultural practices to give access to more nutritious food. I'm a big believer in the power of big ideas. They help people make sense of a complex world, they coordinate partners, and they spark innovative solutions. The work we're discussing today is a big idea. The essays, John, that you described within Keys to Climate Action outline the big idea of a just transition. Leading thinkers from EMDs lay out a framework for next steps on climate action, centered on their unique regional and country perspectives. Each essay makes the case for urgent actions that considers the historic intersection of climate change impact with the existing need to improve human lives and livelihoods through development intervention. The framework underscores the importance of climate investments that avoid human development setbacks. The collection of essays is remarkable. It covers countries ranging from populous hydrocarbon producers such as Indonesia and Nigeria to small, highly vulnerable nation states like Bangladesh. It reinforces their voices under one umbrella to multiply their collective force in the global discourse, particularly around how to allocate finite resources. We couldn't be more pleased with the results and the energy that we're already seeing around these important uh, essays that will soon become a book. And we're very excited about today's discussion, which will take these ideas and add new insights, nuance, and relevance, drawing from the amazing group you'll soon be hearing from. And now over to you, homie. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Zia. Uh, so look, just a uh, couple of uh, quick highlights from uh, my side on uh, some surprises, uh, at least to me, from uh, this work. And uh, the first thing I wanted to mention is uh, just scale. So if you look at developing countries, excluding China, they now account for 40 percent of global emissions. But by 2030, which is not so far into the uh, future, they'll account for more than half of global emissions because their emissions are still rising while those in many advanced economies have peaked and are starting to fall. And this matters because these are the countries, these emerging market uh, countries account for most of the world's population growth, most of its new urbanization growth, and a large share of new infrastructure. And we know that the grow now, clean up later kind of strategy is much more expensive for individual countries and for the world so a new strategy that integrates climate and development is needed. So 
I think I was quite uh, uh, quite surprised in reading the uh, uh, the case studies to see the extent to which developing country government positions are already evolving to develop such a new integrated uh, climate and development strategy. The thinking is advancing, it's growing in sophistication, uh, and I think that uh, uh, you will get a flavor of that as you read many of the chapters. A second surprise uh, that really hit me is how much more complicated things are for developing countries compared to developed countries. In the US and Europe, the green transition is largely about technological innovation. Governments by and large are providing a few incentives, but then allowing market forces to uh, really take over. But in developing countries, this is not nearly enough. The transition issues, the political economy of change are far more acute. The financing constraints are terrible. The need to craft just transitions in countries that are financially strapped becomes so much harder. The institutional processes linking national and subnational levels of government are weaker. Civic engagement and overall transparency on public spending is underdeveloped. Trust is fragile. So when we thought of calling this volume Green Transitions, we were quickly persuaded that this would not be helpful in a developing country context because the issue is so much more complex. So I think that's enough from me. Time to hear from the chapter author's own voices. Over to you, Amar. Um, thank you, thank you, Homi. So I'm Amar Bhattacharya and I'm going to uh, moderate the panel. Uh, and let me begin by introducing them and they, they can come on live. Uh, and I'll do it alphabetically. So our first panelist is Sarah Jain Ahmed. Uh, she's finance advisor to the Vulnerable Group of 20, which are the ministers of uh, finance of the Climate Vulnerable Forum. Uh, second speaker uh, panelist is Richard Callan. He's associate professor of public law at the University of Cape Town and also fellow at the Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership. Uh, third panelist is Mahmoud Moeldin, uh, who wears many hats. Uh, he is executive director at the IMF. Uh, he is special envoy on financing the 2020 Agenda for Sustainable Development. And he is the climate uh, change high-level champion for COP27 and COP28, and therefore very much in centrally in the dis discussions. And uh, last but not least, uh, uh, Vera Songwei, who is a non-resident fellow, a senior fellow with us at the Global Economy and Development Program. Uh, she is also the chair of the liquidity and, and sustainability uh, facility. She was formerly the executive secretary of the Economic Commission for Africa. And she has been very importantly also co-chair of the independent high-level expert group on climate finance. So we have uh, a, a really strong uh, group of uh, uh, panelists. Uh, let me also say that you, know, you should feel free to send your questions um, to, the, to, to, to the panelists uh, at events, uh, uh, events at brookings.edu or using uh, the Twitter handle, the hashtag being keys to climate action. Now we have received some questions already in advance and we will try to weave the questions in to the conversation that we will be having with the panelists. With that, uh, let me turn over to the, uh, to the individual uh, uh, speakers to provide some perspective based on the, the chapters that they were uh, authors of. And I will begin with uh, Mahmoud Moeldin, each of you have three minutes. Uh, Mahmoud. Right, um, th thank you so much. So the, uh, the, the chapter is covering um, the different aspects related to the policy implications of taking a climate action seriously, starting with the data challenge, uh, getting into finance, and then into uh, aspects related to uh, implementation. And uh, the, um, the two co-authors did uh, 
great great work in bringing good evidence and suggestions in the specific case of Egypt. But I think there are many um, uh, shared um, um, lessons and concerns uh, um, uh, from uh, from the Egyptian case to uh, uh, peer developing economies. I'd like to uh, take the matter beyond Egypt into uh, the uh, very important uh, starting point um, that uh, uh, Homey, John, and, and you, uh, Amar, uh, in your uh, introductory chapter, uh, put in a form of a question about um, uh, quoting uh, Prime Minister Maya Motley when she was in Egypt and uh, during COP27, uh, why are we not moving any further? I, I think her question is very much uh, um, um, for the global uh, effort and the international cooperation. And I think uh, another famous question that started uh, with why was uh, from the late uh, um, uh, Queen um, Elizabeth II, uh, when she raised the question why nobody um, or why no one uh, saw it coming. So I think this is going to be the second question in a few years, but actually the answer that everybody was seeing this coming strongly, the impact of climate action on lives and livelihoods are very much strong. And what we see from the Secretary General just a couple of weeks ago, emphasizing that we need to have three actions um, uh, to cut emissions by half, uh, to double um, uh, the efforts on uh, adaptation finance, and um, to uh, push uh, the collaborative efforts uh, towards establishing the loss and damage um, um, uh, file um, or fund. But what we are uh, seeing now is basically the following. Lack in three fronts of action. And uh, for that, the Egypts of the world are suffering. Um, uh, quoting some recent work by Esther uh, Duflo, uh, the very well-known uh, uh, Nobel laureate, when she said we need three things to handle um, uh, the, the challenges facing us, finance, uh, technology, and leadership. And uh, when it comes to finance, you'll, you'll see a country like Egypt is very much overwhelmed by competing uh, demands. And uh, when we try to get uh, that right um, um, without having the whole uh, matter put in a good context, which is not just about climate finance, it should be about development finance at the same time. And this is one of the good uh, results that uh, the work uh, led by you, Amar, Vera, and uh, Nick Stern are reminding us uh, with it that there is no uh, contradiction between efforts towards climate action and development um, uh, finance. The second part is technology. We see in Egypt here some positive signs without the advances in technology that reduced the cost of obtaining um, um, uh, good uh, energy from uh, solar solutions or wind um, 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 wouldn't have been really able to have these kind of capacities installed. And um, uh, Egypt now is proud to have one of the four biggest solar panels in the world. And you will see some similar examples around our region. The final part is basically about uh, leadership. Again, these are the lines of thinking of Esther Duflo, finance, technology, and leadership. And leadership here is not just about the political leadership. It's about the uh, governments, it's about the uh, business sector, it's about the uh, local uh, communities as well. And I would say of what uh, John mentioned earlier about multiple crises or uh, poly crises or perma crises, that leaderships are either uh, overwhelmed or being now weakened um, in the face of crises or confused. And some of them, I would say, uh, myopic as well about priorities. Um, so I think uh, the most important thing, the main lesson is basically how to have a kind of a holistic approach of climate action through which as had been articulated in, uh, during Sharm el -Sheikh, um, uh, summit, that you need to put uh, climate action within that holistic approach through which you can provide solutions to energy, which is facing a crisis, to which you can find solutions to water and food uh, security, which are either seeing uh, big challenges um, or crises. And indeed, we need really, and perhaps I may come back um, uh, later on that, we need to have a better way in dealing with the finance and heavy dependence 
on debt instruments rather than long-term concessional finance and uh, private sec uh, sector equity participation. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Mahmoud. Uh, let me turn to Vera. Vera, if you could provide some perspectives on your uh, Africa chapter with uh, uh, Jean-Paul uh, Adam. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Amar. Uh, uh, and uh, greetings to everybody uh, who is here. Yes, I think um, following up maybe a little bit also on what uh, uh, Mahmoud said, but Homi as well, which is to say that when we talk about climate change, it's not uh, monolithic. And this is what the beauty of this piece is. It's really, we just heard uh, about the different challenges for Egypt, uh, which is part of uh, uh, the continent as well, where its strength and, and, and weaknesses come from. I want to talk about three things, I think, which we try to emphasize in, in this uh, chapter that show that for Africa, the climate conversation is really a prosperity, poverty reduction and growth conversation, first and foremost. We cannot talk about climate change or anything else without really talking about growth and development and of course achieving uh, the SDG goals. To do that, um, we then look at sort of three, what I will call puzzles really about, you know, how Africa could essentially meet its net, net zero targets, but it's not because of a couple of constraints uh, that are continuing to shackle it, even though it is showing leadership. The three puzzles uh, that we talk about in the report, and I'll go very uh, quickly through them. Of course, this is a teaser to, so that you can go read the rest of the report. One of them is on the revenue financing side. And uh, 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 Amar, uh, with your support, uh, uh, Nick and I uh, uh, and, and the high level panel have done this report on sort of the need for a trillion dollars for the climate transition between now and 2025, excluding domestic resource uh, mobilization. But one of the things that we look at in the report is where there is a huge potential for additional revenue gains if one developed a carbon markets. And this is sort of the innovations part of the conversation. At $10 uh, of carbon pricing, we could raise a billion dollars. At $120, we could raise $82 billion. $82 billion for anybody who has been listening to sort of the new liquidity injections that have come into the uh, 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 space recently by SDRs. SDRs, we only got $35 billion. So $82 billion is double what we can actually get with SDRs every year if we were able to get a carbon price in. So I think we put that forward as, you know, there are resources if we put in place the institutional framework, the structures, uh, that can do uh, uh, do this, and we know with JAP and the Rockefeller Foundation and the African uh, Carbon Markets Initiative, we're working on that. But it's not just about the resources. The resources for what? Remember, we said for Africa, climate the climate transition is about poverty reduction. If we are able to hit the price point of one hundred and twenty dollars uh, per carbon, we get almost thirty five to one hundred and sixty seven million jobs created. So this is about you know, job creation, this is about prosperity. So there is a whole conversation there that says for Africa, the climate conversation is a conversation about how we can increase our revenue to GDP, which today, as we know, is very low at about 17% revenue to GDP. We need to get to 30% revenue to GDP to actually have sustainable growth. The second uh, one is around uh, trade. We have just signed as a continent, the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement. This is really to power uh, a more exchange within the continent. But if we're not careful, as we all know, trade can be, we've seen this in East Asia, right? Trade can be quintessentially a huge polluting activity. And so if one just looked at trade as, you know, trade as we did it before, this time is not different, this time is the same, then of course we will be going down the wrong direction. However, if we looked at trade as, you know, a way for us to transition away from the way we've done trade, the way we've exchanged goods using railways and doing more carbon intensive trade to more green value chains, then we become a much more prosperous continent, but also a continent that is contributing to climate change. And we look at one specific examples, of course, around the battery uh, vehicles uh, production uh, 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 framework. And we look at a country like DRC, where today DRC only exports, the total exports of uh, cobalt and lithium is $8 billion. The whole sort of battery 
precursor market is 271 billion. The electric vehicle market is about 1.3 trillion. For Africa's uh, continental free trade area agreement to work, we've done some studies at the Economic Commission for Africa with Jean-Paul and the team, uh, uh, Stephen Karingi and the trade side as well, that show that we need about 2.2 million new vehicles just to move goods from one place to the other. So essentially, if we move the electric vehicles into the African Continental Free Trade Area Agreement, then Africa is ready and poised to take advantage of the climate uh, uh, conversation, contribute to it, but also uh, insist on the growth agenda. And finally, energy. A lot of conversation today around energy. We wrote the report uh, before the UK, re, Ukraine crisis. So we talk a lot more about the energy conversations as we were uh, having them during the COVID crisis. And it's an interesting number. Africa today exports only 2% to the rest of the world. Africa is 17% of the world's population, but only uses 3.4% of the world's energy. However, Africa has almost 60% of the world's hydrogen resources. It has 70% of the world's uh, solar resources that it could put into use. And so again, you know, if we were able to solve this puzzle of saying Africa's transition is a transition that first requires it to be able to inject its grid with stability that can allow it to put more energy on that grid and hence the use of the just transition for the continent with gas as one of its fundamental uh, powering tools. But then that will allow us much quicker and much faster to get into the production of batteries, so going backwards, to get into the production of batteries to do more carbon and to end up in a place where we have a more prosperous uh, continent. The final thing is that all of these conversations have come out in a way in Africa through the African Union. We've had uh, meetings in Kigali, meetings in, 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 in Dakar that have shown Africa speaking with one voice and trying to use regional platforms to be able to leverage Africa's potential, one for revenue generation through the carbon market, through uh, 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 the carbon trade, but also through the Congo Basin Initiative where we worked a lot with Mahmoud and yourself, Amar, uh, to see whether we could begin uh, to design sort of carbon registries for the continent that allow us to integrate the global conversations, but, we, but with integrity standards that are uniquely ours. So these are some of the things that we have in the report. It's some policy uh, perspective, some areas for investment, and then of course, the ideas of where we get the growth in a different and alternative way uh, that is sustainable and leads us to a net zero environment by 2050. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Vera. Indeed, you know, I'm struck by how well organized Africa is in representing its views in the global discussions, you know, compared to other uh, regions. And I think the Economic Commission for Africa, which you headed, has played a very, very key role in that. Uh, if I could turn to uh, third, uh, our third speaker, Sarah Jane Ahmed, uh, she is advisor to the B20 you know, which encompasses the most vulnerable countries of the world. Uh, Sarah, your perspectives from your chapter. Thank you, Amar. Um, so I think just very quickly, it's clear that climate fueled risks have driven up the cost of capital um, and debt to unsustainable levels. Um, and we're already witnessing uh, horrific financial protection gaps. 40 of the 58 V20 members are in debt distress. And the V20 countries have lost over half a trillion US dollars in the last two decades due to climate change. And uh, over the next um, seven years, the total debt service payment is also half a trillion. Uh, so if we're not alarmed by this, there's something deeply wrong in our system. Uh, the way forward uh, and the chapter highlights that there is really no trade-off um, between uh, climate action and development, and that is it is a great opportunity to drive new investment. Um, and so uh, the way forward to build necessary adaptation and resilience means the delivery of development positive climate action. Uh, and any lasting solution on climate will require uh, a reform of the international financial architecture, including debt reform, uh, the shifting of financial flows to serve climate goals, but also the mainstreaming of surveillance of climate risks to drive new investment. Um, another really important um, point uh, is that uh, this debt and climate crisis is not just about um, the urgent need to rapidly protect our economies. Uh, everyone needs to understand that securing robust and lasting resilience is fundamental 
vital to the ability of the 58 countries representing 1.4 billion people to accelerate as well the global energy transition and contribute a global positive impact on keeping to the 1.5 degree Celsius limit of the Paris Agreement. Um, all in all, uh, the emissions of the V20 are, are larger than Russia, uh, and so there is a great opportunity to be part of the solution um, and to drive new investment. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, our last uh, opening intervention is from Richard Gallon, uh, the author of the South Africa chapter. Yes, thank you, Amar, and thank you to you, uh, John, and to Homi for inviting me to be part of this, this project. This is an important book at a very important time, it seems to me, and, and particularly so for those of us in South Africa who are really now immersed in our own transition. Uh, and I'll briefly sketch what seemed to me to be the main contours of that transition in just a second as a summary of uh, my, my chapter. The Being involved in this project was an opportunity for me to spend rare time with a group of development economists. Uh, I'm very different. I'm at best a political economist, at worst a simple-minded lawyer, uh, focusing on issues of governance and institutional uh, reform. And one of the main epiphanies that I had in this project, which is uh, especially pertinent for us now in South Africa, is that the old world that is being so fiercely uh, and at times uh, dangerously, dishonestly defended by people who with vested interests in the fossil fuel sector, is that that is a sector and a form of, of economic development that simply is not delivering. It's not delivering socioeconomic justice, in uh, countries of sub-Saharan Africa and the rest of the global south. And here in South Africa, where we have no real excuse for this, we are in the midst of a really appalling energy security crisis. Much of the country is enduring uh, several hours a day of what we uh, euphemistically call load shedding or power cuts uh, every day. Uh, and there is no end in sight because of the uh, complex uh, origins of this uh, crisis. One of the main features of that crisis is the failure of government to have embarked on this transition with greater decisiveness and with greater strategic vision uh, over quite a long period of time. But I'm pleased to say now that we have an opportunity to escape this morass, and that opportunity derives essentially from what I think we might want to start to call transition finance now. And as many of you in this room will recognize and know, uh, emanating from Glasgow and then uh, being uh, concluded last year, COP27, uh, South Africa is to receive 8.5 billion US dollars of international climate finance, uh, one of the largest, if not the largest packages uh, of climate finance for our transition. Now, uh, not all the T's have been crosses, crossed or all the I's dotted of that yet, but checks have been signed, the money has begun to flow. And the onus now sits very much with us here in South Africa to ensure that we spend this money wisely, that the investment plan and the implementation plan that is following the investment plan is one that can be executed. We uh, have a poor record of turning uh, big plans and big ideas into action, uh, and we need to be able to do better on that front. So that's the immediate challenge. What my book does is sketch, firstly, under three headings, all beginning with P. Firstly, it sketches the policy uh, ambitions of South Africa, which are really to find a way to align its climate responsibilities as a relatively high emitter of carbon, uh, align its uh, climate responsibilities globally, uh, its need for its own good economic uh, uh, self-enlightened interest to get out of coal as fast as possible, uh, and to um, uh, contribute through its NDCs to, to the global effort. Secondly, uh, to find a way of navigating what is euphemistically described as a complex uh, political economy. There are vested interests in coal that uh, find their way deep into the ruling party, the African National Congress. There are legitimate interests uh, that are concerned with uh, how to protect the livelihoods and communities of parts of South Africa that are deeply uh, committed to and dependent on coal and the coal industry, and uh, find a way of building, and this is the opportunity, of building new industrial value chains that emanate from and surround the renewable energy sector, but which are truly uh, homegrown and which deliver socioeconomic value and transformative change to communities in South Africa. 
The, the caricature that sits with some cabinet ministers and which is an obstacle to progress is that we may run the risk of swapping coal mining jobs and livelihoods in South Africa for profits with renewable energy companies in Europe. Of course, that is an oversimplification, but there is also a grain of truth in it. And part of the, uh, the transition plan has to be to combat that with granular evidence about how to build those new industrial value chains. That is the extra extraordinary opportunity we now face. Uh, a process solution lies ahead of us. So far, we have embarked on this transition only because of the good work of the Presidential Climate Commission. Uh, and I sketched the work of that as a sort of sub-case study within the greater case study of South Africa, uh, a piece of, uh, of institutional machinery that enabled the president to navigate some of these uh, political economy obstacles, to build consensus around the need for a just transition, to build consensus around the notion of what a just transition actually looks like, uh, and to do so in a very inclusive, participatory and transparent fashion. That was a rare good news story uh, after many years of, of misgovernance and bad governance in our country. And with a reform-minded president, uh, I am uh, modestly optimistic that we can now proceed with this transition, despite all of the obstacles that no doubt lie ahead of us. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, we'll now move to a panel format. And as I said, we had a, a bunch of questions already. We may receive more. And what I've done is I put uh, I've structured the panel into a set of uh, thematic issues which come out from the country studies, but also respond very much to the discussion uh, and the questions. And let me begin really with the impact of climate change. Uh, virtually every country study, and rather you know starkly, such as the ones of Bangladesh and uh, Nigeria as well as the regional studies uh, you know, make the point that climate change is here and now having a severe impact and a disproportionate impact on developing countries. Uh, against that backdrop, they also make the point that most uh, developing countries are ill-prepared to respond and ill-prepared to build resilience. So my first question is to you, Sarah, you know, representing the V20, uh, what should countries such as the V20 do really on the adaptation and resilience agenda at this point in time? Yeah. Thanks, Omar. Uh, in terms of the impacts of climate change, it's permeating not just through inf not just in infrastructure, but even health, heat stress, massive productivity losses. Um, and so what they're looking to do now is uh, one, it will require support from the international community, but to put forward strong plans in order to uh, ensure that they are adapted and resilient. And this is in the form of climate prosperity plans. Um, and so Bangladesh has done the first, Sri Lanka has followed Ghana, um, and the pipeline now stands at 30 countries. Um, and here it's about, you know, how could we course correct? What kind of industries can we build um, as a result of trying to transform our economy, um, how do we ensure that we have adapted institutions who could better understand um, where to put such finite resources? So there's there's a lot, I think, moving in countries. However, um, the debt crisis and debt distress is strapping opportunity and ability. Um, and so it would be really important that in 2023, uh, this year that there would be progress done on the on the on the front on the side of debt reform um, in order to enable this opportunity uh, to course correct and ensure that uh, the the V20 especially could reach their um, uh, SDG targets um, as well as for the G7 and the G20 it would be critical that they keep to the 1.5 degree limit of the Paris Agreement as well. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, let me turn to you, Vera. Uh, you know, you were on the front line of kind of seeing the impact of climate change in Africa and also in helping Africa, you know, come up with its uh, strategy of response. How do you see, you know, the, the adaptation and resilience agenda from the African perspective? 
No, thank you. I think uh, uh, just to to sort of give a sense of where we are and then what we do with it with that, twenty percent of the African population today is at is at risk of uh, going hungry uh, because of uh, changing weather patterns. Uh, we have huge pressure now on our cities because a lot of uh, the populations are moving to the to the cities and forcing uh, huge urbanization. What do we need to do? We've done some studies, as you've said. Uh, again, at the Economic Commission for Africa, uh, with teams uh, that are led by Jean Paul, uh, showing that, for example, if you invest in uh, irrigation technology, better and more improved irrigation technology, the return on that could be 500 uh, 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 percent. The the your investment. If you look at places like Malawi that are suffering from drought, Malawi benefits from huge waterways. And so being able to use better and more improved irrigation for Malawi will of course reduce uh, the impact of uh, climate change. But of course, this is uh, uh, the beginning of it. One, another part of the adaptation conversation, and we are all looking and our prayers and thoughts go to the people of Turkey. We are all looking at what is happening in Turkey. And we know for sure that there are issues around sort of using climate smart uh, 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 cement, climate smart buildings, uh, doing uh, our buildings in different and more improved ways so that we can do better. If you come from the Horn of Africa, we've seen huge new droughts, uh, uh, you know, followed by locusts and then followed by floods. I think those kinds of uh, continuous changes in weather patterns have also led to the need for technology, digitization, to be able to predict weather patterns early enough so that we can then uh, address them. There is a new report that has just come out by Standard Chartered that shows that for every dollar that we spend on prevention and building resilience, we save about $16. Uh, in terms of responding to the loss and damage side. Having said that, we're very happy that in the Egypt COP, uh, we were able to put enough pressure on the uh, developing com developed community to create a fund for loss and damage and manage it. And that uh, institutions like the IMF are now with uh, following the, the call of the Prime Minister of Barbados, Mayor Motley, to have uh, catastrophic insurance uh, instruments in some of the products so that countries can actually benefit from those. Uh, thank you, Vera. Uh, let me now turn to another topic, and that's really, you know, the tension between the opportunity that climate action provides, but also the constraints that developing countries face in acting boldly on climate action. So everywhere there's a recognition that, you know, climate action could actually unlock new and better forms of growth. Uh, and uh, you know, uh, could help us avoid the mistakes of the past. But policymakers in the South still remain quite hesitant. And this is particularly the case with regard to energy transition, um, you know, which is at the heart, of course, of climate action in, in the sense of moving to a low carbon path. Uh, if I could begin with you, Mahmoud, why do you, uh, you know, what do you see as the reason for this apparent contradiction, you know, not only in Egypt, but you have been so involved in the wider discussions of the South. Uh, and, you know, also, as you said, how can we ensure that we do not see the climate agenda as separate, but something really quite integral to the SDG and the development agenda? Right. Um, to be uh, realistic and uh, practical, there is no way whatsoever for a developing economy or an emerging market to deal with the climate action agenda without really putting it at the center of development and sustainable development. The whole debate had been suffering from a reductionist approach uh, led by some of the advanced economies um, to uh, talk about climate action without really uh, serious attention to be given to the implications, including just transition, including the impact on labor and communities, um, 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 without really paying sufficient attention to what it would require in terms of prioritization of finance. And then we suffered more recently during the last couple of years in particular about more false dichotomies. I mentioned one briefly, which is basically about the climate versus um, uh, development dichotomy. And we know that climate action at the end 
um, will really result if we are articulating the policies right, will can result in improvement of energy access, SDG 7, improvement in water, if it is about adaptation, SDG 6, it can improve uh, uh, poverty, SDG 1, and the reverse, if we are ignoring all of that. But what is more worrying, really, is this kind of waste of time discussion about country platforms versus global public goods. There is no way whatsoever you, you can be serious about uh, tackling the global public goods without engaging in some country somewhere, without really having some investments in some projects, like the one mentioned earlier by Richard in energy um, in, uh, in South Africa. And that was really one of the main outcomes that came from uh, Glasgow, phasing out from coal, investing in renewables, dealing with the communities. This is very much SDGs in action, not just climate in action. And the other thing, the main constraint, again, is, is finance. Um, um, and, and here, let me just put it simply and bluntly. Climate finance, and I would say development finance at large, is suffering from the fact of being insufficient, inefficient, unfair, and unbalanced. Insufficient because of the work that you refer to, Vera, your work with Nick Stern and dozen of economists, even if we take the critical minimum of the one trillion that appeared uh, in previous work by Ammar, Homi, and others, the one trillion is 10 times, which is a very conservative figure, 10 times the promised 100 billion. Uh, since Copenhagen, we didn't see that amount of money in full. We only have six to seven countries uh, providing their fair share. And even if they do the 100 billion, that is only 10% of what is being required. And then you see the alternatives. You see that developing economies are more dependent on debt instruments, more than 61% globally of finance for climate is coming in debt uh, instruments, um, less than 15% of concessional uh, terms and conditions. And if you uh, uh, check some of the uh, developing countries, the, the, the share could be even higher when it comes to that. It's inefficient because I um, um, have been seeing in some of the disbursements of funds uh, from the day that you shake hands with your financier until you get the funds is two to three years. Um, some small island countries in adaptation in particular, it takes more than three years. Uh, so this is a sign of inefficiency. And then the unfairness is about the cost. And that's why some of us put these kind of proposals of putting a cap on, um, uh, on the cost of borrowing. I put a proposal of 1% for the 1.5 degrees. And we can put the $100 billion to finance this cost of borrowing. And then we need to, really to have a grace period of no less than 10 years. Those of us who work with the World Bank or with the IMF know that grace periods can be as um, long as 10 years, which is the case of the RST now of the IMF. And typically it's five to seven and more um, in, uh, years in uh, the case of Ida. And we need to have the payback period or the maturity of the loan to be no less than 20 years. And then the issue of, uh, of being unbalanced. So I spoke about insufficient, inefficient, unfair. And the unbalanced part here is basically when you check the, uh, um, uh, the, the share of adaptation, which is basically the main concern of countries like the African countries. The emissions from the African countries is less than 3%. Our major concern is basically about the impact on communities, on coastal areas, on agriculture, on cities, on water management, on food security. And the adaptation share is less than 15 to 20% in many of the development financial institutions. 80% goes to mitigation. And unfortunately, in some cases, they uh, crowd out and don't leverage the private sector finance because of bad designs. That needs to change. All of that needs to change. And then we can talk about the 100 billion as a token of trust. We can talk about principles of finance post 2025. We can talk about innovation, like the one mentioned by Vera on carbon. We can talk about debt swaps, all of that. But the fundamentals need to be put right from the prioritization of finance coming from the budgets of the state to the kind of support that could come from the international financial institutions. Otherwise, we can have another book launch and we'll still see the major constraints facing us. It's finance, cooperation and technical assistance, a lack of leadership to push them in the right direction. Uh, thank you, Mahmoud. And indeed, finance is central. Um, let me turn to Vera, given you know, the, the group that you co-chaired, Vera, 
and the insights from that. I mean, do you, do you see an agenda coming, you know, out of that exercise and, you know, reflected in, in the book that, you know, this book around a finance agenda that moves us constructively forward? Yes, I know. Thank you uh, uh, for that. I think that what we we, we try to do in 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 the the report with Nick and, and 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 the panel is really to look at you know first of all yes finance is important but break it up into sort of what kinds of finance what amounts of finance um, starting uh, first of all as when we always talk about finance the first thing that we talk about in the report is that policy is finance good policy you know, crowds in more resources, bad policies. Of course, even if you get resources are more expensive. Mamu talked about debt. We certainly do not want countries to get into debt uh, to finance the climate transition. Beyond that, then it comes to the multilateral development banks. The MDBs need to be front and center in this conversation because we need concessional financing. Concessional financing at scale is critical. We need anyway uh, a, a scale up from 60 billion to 180 billion of concessional financing from the MDBs to get to where we want to get to. We need to double bilateral climate finance about another 60 billion between uh, 2020 and 2025 to be able to do that. Adaptation finance, there is a plan that needs to be worked out. I think when we start talking about it, uh, a lot of the MDB financing uh, that uh, Mahmoud has also talked about is for the middle-income countries. But there is also a sort of low-cost financing that is needed, and that's where the SDRs uh, become an important component of the finance agenda. I think some of us and Mahmoud and, and many of us are calling for a climate SDRs that need to be issued, not issued along a, 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 a sort of quarter uh, rights, but maybe around vulnerability and exposure, which countries are more exposed. Of course, the Resilience and Sustainability Trust is already responding to some of the uh, uh, imperatives of the need for low cost uh, uh, finance. But then there is also uh, uh, the need for philanthropy to come in. And we've seen uh, quite an amount of entry in philanthropy, I think from the Bezos Foundation, of course, the Rockefeller Foundation that is with us and many others that are providing, because the question is also when the finance comes, where at what point does it come? We need a lot of this philanthropic capital to come in to just help develop uh, the projects. Finally, mobilizing private capital is going to be critical. We have all heard about the Global Financial Alliance to so Net Zero, the G funds and the $130 trillion of financing that is available in the private sector. But it has to come for it for us to be able to bring it to de-risk uh, some of the projects that we're talking about, to leverage some of the projects, to provide guarantees for that. We need a good policy environment. We need the MDBs to come first. And so some additional financing and additional capital to the MDBs really becomes the sort of cornerstone of any conversation around um, how we get to achieve this green climate agenda in the next five to 10 years. Uh, thank, thank you, Vera. Um, we have uh, five minutes left exactly in this panel. And what I want to do is just ask each of you to you know, identify what would you think are really the key opportunities and now for developing countries to push ahead on climate in a way that is development centric. What do you think are the big actions that can be taken uh, you know, from the perspective of your regions and also you know, the subject areas that you've been mentioning? So let me begin with Richard uh, uh, Callan. Richard, you know, particularly from the South Africa perspective, and the political economy issues you mentioned, what do you see as a way forward that will really take us to the next level in South Africa with lessons for other countries? And you have a minute each, I should say. No pressure. Thank you, Amar. So building on what uh, Mahmoud and Vera just said, in, in, uh, in my country, in South Africa, it's going to require great leadership. The leadership is going to have to overcome this false dichotomies that Mahmoud spoke of, which is very damaging. There's an war, information war uh, going on, which has to be settled uh, in order to smooth the pathway. Uh, and secondly, um, on, on Vera's point about finance, uh, clearly because of suspicions around the quality and quantity of the finance available, those have to be overcome. It has to be sufficient, it has to be fair, and it has to be reasonable. And the 
the, the 8.5 billion US dollars is just a start. Amar, you helped us in South Africa come to the realization that by 2035, we will need 250 billion US dollars to complete this transition. Uh, private finance is interest, interested, investors are circling around, but what they need now, secondly, is policy certainty. Uh, and they need political certainty. So the leadership has to bring that policy and political certainty. They don't want to feel that th this reform-minded president is going to be thrown out. They, they want to be confident that the processes that have been put in place will protect the finance, will ensure that the implementation plan can stay on track, and will ensure that the vested coal interests will not get in the way of progress and take us backwards. So that's just a, a very small slice of the task that lies ahead. But the grand prize is to build a new economy, an economy in which jobs are better, safer, and better skilled. Uh, and we ex and we take ourselves out of the Victorian extractive industries, uh, fuel fossil fuel-based economy that has been South Africa's painful legacy, I would suggest. Thank, thank you, Richard. Uh, Sarah, in a couple sentences, your three big, uh, you know, kind of hopes and asks. Um, so as you know, there's a spiraling debt crisis, um, and the fact is there's no way but to invest out of climate chaos. Um, and so what will make the greatest difference today is the acceptance that we must and absolutely must move away from the demonstrable harm of business as usual austerity measures. Um, and it's high time that we try to transform the investment flows towards this new economy that we must build. Um, the headroom is critical from the MDBs and the additional space can be positioned for this development positive climate action. Um, but also the biggest challenge, it's similar to what Richard um, was saying, um, is the honest recognition that action um, uh, predicated on the acceptance that the financial rationale for fossil fuels has, has completely evaporated. I mean, fossil fuel companies now have to rely on political mechanisms to maintain demand and, and support for supply and the knowledge that there will be actors looking to undermine the work of pursuing global governance mechanisms to find solutions. So once we accept that reality that the, the financial rationale for fossil fuels is completely evaporated, it'll be even easier to deny these companies the political oxygen that is currently keeping them alive so that we can build forward the economy that we need to ultimately survive um, the next decades. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Vera, you already laid out a very fulsome agenda. Uh, anything you wish to highlight in particular? We, I think that the, the only thing really that we, uh, uh, Mahmoud has, as has mentioned a little bit and, and Sarah Jane as well, is the geopolitics of climate. We need to move away from announcements. We need to move away from uh, uh, talking about, you know, small pilots to really using this uh, current environment to see how we can leapfrog into, into a, a much more energy secure continent. I think we have all seen that energy security in Europe is growth in Europe. Energy security in Africa is growth in the world because we are going to be uh, the most populous continent uh, in the next 10 to uh, 30 years. So I think really looking at that as an energy security, we saw in eight months an LNG platform uh, developed for Germany from the United States. The kind of collaboration that is now happening internationally with the IR, the Inflation Reduction Act, uh, the Green Act, the Gateway, program in the European Union, these kinds of partnerships must also benefit uh, the continent in a way that helps them to accelerate their uh, conversion to net zero. Thank you. Thank you, Vera. Uh, Mahmoud, I have a big challenge for you. Uh, you could take a long, uh, a long time given the role you are playing on COP27 and COP28, but what would be your one aspiration for COP28 given what you said earlier. Right, uh, COP27, as you know, it was the implementation COP. And um, uh, COP28 has announced in um, the United Arab Emirates is the solutions COP. So it's again getting us into these kind of tr practical aspects, operationalize the good uh, uh, lines of thinking, projectize the good ideas to the points raised by Sarah Jane 
invest and invest and invest. It's invest in mitigation. Um, uh, we hope that the money will be flowing nicely to South Africa, to India, to Vietnam, through JP, but more funds are required for other countries, including in decarbonization and for the transition as well in um, to, towards renewable energy. It's about projects. Adaptation based on the Sharm el Sheikh um, adaptation agenda. It's all about projects in agricultural system, food systems, coastal areas, investments again. And then even the loss and damage, um, we need to put it in a kind of an investment nar narrative for restructuring. These are the three lines of defense. Two of them had already been compromised in our war against climate, the mitigation one and the adaptation one. And that's why we're talking about loss and damage. So we need really to see how best we can really get these flows of funds the promise of the GFAN, the partnerships with the private sector, especially mitigation. And then we see how can we mobilize public finance and international finance towards um, 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 adaptation. My worry is that some examples are being put now in some advanced economies that have been a bit protectionist and a bit inward looking. All of these green deals are not really setting a good examples of a collaborative model um, coming from North America or from Europe. What we need is a more open system. Perhaps these countries have their own resources they can invest within, but the rest of us developing economies and emerging markets require foreign direct investment, private equity, supported by technology and technical uh, um, uh, collaboration. And as mentioned by Vera, some good de-risking from the MDBs as well to enhance these flows of funds. So the solutions are there, and again, the mix, finance, technology, and leadership need to be emphasized. Thank, thank you, Mahmoud. Um, I, I, we are out of time, so I just have uh, only one thing to do, which is to thank uh, you know, those who are responsible for getting us here. But be, let me begin with the audience. Uh, we really need everybody's energy on this journey, and it's really good that so many of you are interested and committed to this agenda. We hope the book will give you food for thought, but also that the book will give you inspiration to push the agenda, particularly you know, from the perspective of the developing countries. Uh, second, I want to thank uh, Rockefeller, which John did already, uh, for actually having, in some sense, uh, triggered and enabled this exercise. Uh, I'd like to thank each and every one of our authors, uh, because without them, we wouldn't have the feast we have right now. And finally, I want to thank the team that has worked exceptionally hard to produce the product. Uh, that includes Andrea Risotto, Esther Rosen, Junji Ren, uh, Janina Hero, and Izzy Taylor. Uh, and obviously, I want to end by thanking Daniel Bicknell, who has been the master of choreography and really the one putting in all the hard work to get us here. And my, finally, my, my two co-editors, uh, you know, who have been, uh, you know, with, with, with me on this journey. So with that, let me bring this uh, uh, to a close. Uh, and thank you again, everybody, for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, Amar. Great job. Thank you. Thank you.